Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to a new edition of More Bad News. Uh, the last one I did was uh, about a month ago, Passover, uh, on the historicity of the exodus from Egypt. And it was really kind of well received. Uh, and um, I'm realizing that uh, I don't have to do these anymore. I used to have to post for my students, but uh, it, it's enjoyable. The, you know, I, I like doing them and uh, and uh, I'm getting several hundred views for uh, about 500 views on the last one. So that's enough, you know, to encourage me to continue. And I think going forward that I'm going to try to post a video every Sunday, uh, as I used to do when I was teaching and uh, on some topic or other. Uh, this is uh, Shabbos and tomorrow. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Shuas. Yes, it was Shabbos. This is Shuas, uh, and uh, and we read the Book of Ruth. And I thought that I would uh, spend a little time talking about uh, some of the interesting aspects of the hist historicity of the Book of Ruth. Um, all right. So, um, for those uh, unfamiliar with the Jewish calendar, uh, Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot are the three pilgrimage holidays. Uh, in ancient Israel, Jews gathered together to celebrate the harvest three times a year. These are three harvests, and, and they originally harvest festivals, and, and, then, and then when you have the, uh, uh, the United Kingdom, when you have a monarchy and, and you have a capital in Jerusalem, uh, so the temple was built in Jerusalem, and then uh, on these three holidays, the harvest, people would come to Jerusalem, bring parts of their harvest to celebrate. Um, and, um, uh, and yet keep in mind that, that uh, Judaism uh, is a religion uh, that emerges after the destruction of the temple. Uh, that uh, for the first 1500 years of the existence of the, uh, of, uh, of the Israelites, um, it's a very different religion. I mean, you know, you have a religion that is based on sacrifice, on animal sacrifice, uh, and based on, you know, uh, on a uh, on a temple. You have a priestly class. Um, none of this exists any longer. Modern Judaism emerges uh, really with the destruction of the temple uh, and the, and the end of the sacrificial system. And it's worthwhile noting that that is. At that point in history, about 66, 70 CE, you have the emergence of both Christianity and modern Judaism. And modern Judaism and Christianity are very similar religions that emerge out of this cauldron of, uh, of conflict uh, that results in the destruction of the Second Temple. Um, and um, the uh, so this this period uh, of the uh, uh, Second Temple uh, is also a, uh, a, a, a period of uh, tremendous innovation. Uh, you have the, the Maccabean Revolt around 160 BCE, uh, and this was a period of revolt until the destruction. Um, it was a period of great inst inst insecurity and instability, uh, and it is known as the late biblical period or LBH, late biblical Hebrew is what it's called, uh, it refers to. And, uh, and this is Hebrew that has a lot of Persian and Greek words in it uh, and influences. Uh, the books written during this period also contain many Persian and Greek ideas. Uh, so it's not just the vocabulary. If you look at the Song of Songs in the Book of Esther, neither of which mention God, uh, you will also see that they contain surprisingly innovative ideas. Contrast, for example, the story of the Garden of Eden with the Song of Songs. In one, sex is problematic. Adam and Eve end up getting expelled from Eden. Uh, in the Song of Songs, two young lovers experience the same transition without any of the concerns found in the garden. Uh, and remember, they're clearly not married. They meet at night, they separate during the day. Um, uh, it is, uh, uh, the heroine is defiantly unapologetic. The song is a beautiful erotica, clearly influenced by Greek culture. It is also uh, probably, it's also probable that it, it, we owe uh, the idea that death uh, is the liberation of the soul from the body to Greek culture, to specifically to, uh, to uh, Plato in his book, Phaedro. Uh, and um, for that, by the way, um, I would recommend this book, The Death of Death. Um, uh, Gilman points out that uh, in, in the Torah, up right up until 
the Psalms, uh, you do not really have a concept of, uh, of a soul uh, and a, that goes to heaven. Um, in, the, in the Psalms, what you have is Hashemayim, Shemayim, Laranoi, Vahoris, and Son of Meadam, the Omeisim, Yahalulio, the local Yorde Duma. The heavens are the heavens of God. The human beings never go to heaven. The earth is where human beings live. Uh, and uh, and uh, and when they die, they go to a place of silence, Duma, and they never praise God. They never leave there. It's, it's no return from there. It's a uh, it's not a dualistic idea. Um, the um, the Persian influence is also very pronounced in this period, and it was the Persians who defeated the Babylonians uh, and the uh, Persian Empire. Cyrus uh, gave so so that the 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 Babylonians. Uh, 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 destroyed the temple in 586 BCE um, and, dis and exiled the Jews to Babylon where the Babylonian Talmud was written. The Persians defeat the Babylonians and Cyrus gives the Jews permission to return to Palestine and to rebuild the temple, build a second temple. Um, in all of this period, in the Babylonian period of Babylonian rule and the period of Persian rule across this enormous Persian influence, uh, especially through the Zoroastrian eschatology. Um, eschatology is the that part of theology that is concerned with death, judgment, and final the final destiny of the soul and humankind. Uh, religions understand come into existence and they evolve and they pass out of existence. Uh, according to a quick Google search, there are between one and two hundred thousand Zoroastrians today, but there are no Ugarites. So. The Ugarites were a Semitic tribe like the Israelites, and a library of their cuneiform texts were found at Ras Shamra in Syria in 1928. The texts are significantly older than the biblical texts. They're written between the 13th and the 12th centuries BCE, and many of the stories in the Torah are found in these tablets, cuneiform tablets. The religion evolved in the same region of Mesopotamia as the Israelite religion, but the Ugarites are no longer with us. The Israelites survived and their religion evolved over the past 3,500 years. So uh, it's not widely understood, but ancient Israelite theology was distinctly different from today's Jewish theology. Early biblical texts, say from the five books of Moses to the Psalms, viewed the universe as divided between the heavens and the earth, with the earth occupied by God, and with the heavens occupied by God and his celestial companions, humans did not aspire to go to heaven. It wasn't a thing. Uh, humans lived on the earth and had no soul. When you died, you descended to a place called Duma, and there you were never heard from again. You take a look at Psalm 115, which I quoted before, the heavens are the heavens of Adonai and the earth was given to man. The dead do not extol the Lord, those who descend to Duma. Uh, if you check Robert Alter's comment, on the Psalms there, he says clearly that the, uh, at the time, Israelites did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. Uh, the dead never come back. There is no soul. The soul was a later religious invention. And uh, for more on that, see Neil Gilman's book. It's a very interesting book. Uh, so one of the main characteristics of this early Judaism, this early period, is the emergence of a complex set of ideas that deal with the future of the Jewish people and the history of the end of the world and humanity. Uh, the history of the world is linked to that of the Jewish people and their hopes for a restoration of Israel, which is often expected to be ushered in by a messianic figure. The great turning point of world history will involve both destruction and renewal and will be announced by various signs and cataclysms. A final battle between good and evil is predicted in several Jewish texts and uh, is in fact described in the war scroll from Qumran, uh, where the sons of light will fight the sons of death. To this universal eschatology, which is often colored by apocalyptic ideas, corresponds an individual eschatology that distinguishes between the righteous and the wicked uh, the, uh, on the day of judgment uh, the uh, uh, righteous going to heaven and the wicked going to hell. Both the whole complex of eschatolo eschatological ideas 
and the particular beliefs within it, such as the bodily resurrection of the dead and the final battle between good and evil at the, uh, at the end of time, have counterparts in Zoroastrian uh, uh, documents, uh, uh, religion. And some sort of connection is usually assumed. In Zoroastrianism, universal and individual eschatologies date from the early fifth uh, century or, or earlier, and that's, that's well before the biblical texts. So uh, uh, it is generally considered that there's been some kind of influence from Zoroastrian uh, Persian Iranian ideas on uh, Judaism, that these ideas evolved. But it isn't just like uh, uh, the, uh, Judaism just took over these, but rather that there were elements of this within Judaism and they evolve um, under this kind of influence. It's good to go back to the harvest festivals, um, Sukkot and Shuot. Uh, each harvest festival was invested with a religious significance. Passover marks the exodus from Egypt. Shavuot, 49 days later, uh, is the assembly at Mount Sinai where Moses received the Torah. So Shuot is the receiving of the Torah. Sukkot marks the 40 years in the desert. It's traditional to count the days between Passover and Shavuot, and each day, each night, Karen and I would count the Omer. Um, Jews around the world do this together. There's a kind of synchronized harmonies, and they're ubiquitous in Judaism. We all light candles on Friday evening, uh, and there are many of us, myself included, who are now studying uh, a particular page of Talmud every day. There are 2,711 pages of Talmud, and it takes about seven and a half years uh, if you do a, a, a page a day, a daf yomi, daf a day. And there's a whole cycle, and around the world, there are about 300,000 uh, people who study the same daf. And right now, we're, uh, we're this is, this is, this is mine, uh, to be a, show a little bit what it looks like. Uh, and this happens to be a first edition, Vilna, Gemara. It's, it's a 158-year-old Gemara uh, that I'm privileged to have uh, from my grandfather's uh, synagogue. Um, and, um, and it's all about Yavamas. It, it, the name of it is Yavamas. It's about Leverite marriage, which is uh, what this holiday <laughs> really hinges on. Um, so uh, this is the, uh, 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 the first uh, tractate in the uh, in the order of the Mishnah that talks about women. And so um, I am uh, really uh, uh, hoping to get a much better idea of Talmudic views uh, on marriage and, uh, and things like this. If, uh, if you were a fan of Deadwood, you might remember that Seth Bullock's brother was killed in the Civil War and Seth marries his brother's widow and becomes father to his brother's son. That's sort of the idea. Now, biblical law doesn't allow you to marry your brother's widow if she has a son. So that that's not biblical. But the idea of, of taking responsibility for your brother's wife, uh, that is biblical. Uh, and the book of, of Ruth is about uh, the Lever Leverite obligation. Boaz is a redeeming relative. Basically, you know, Ruth um, uh, is a Moabite. Elimelech goes um, to Moab, uh, his son uh, marries Ruth, he dies. She comes back with Naomi uh, and Boaz is a redeeming relative. And so the story revolves around that, but it goes back, there's also uh, more to it because uh, the Moabites themselves are the result of uh, 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 the, uh, the uh, Tamar, uh, and and Judah, um, the uh, 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 Judah is the the one of the sons of, of Jacob, uh, and he has three sons, uh, Er, Onan, and Shelah, uh, and uh, and uh, and Er marries a, a Canaanite girl, uh, 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 Tamar, uh, and he dies. Um, uh, Onan uh, uh, has a a Leverite obligation uh, to uh, raise up a son in his brother's name. He doesn't want to do it, and so he spills his seed on the ground, which is a sin, and God punishes him, and he dies. Judah doesn't 
want to give Tamar his last son because he's kind of afraid of this is this whole thing isn't going very well, but she will not be deterred. Uh, Tamar dresses up, uh, disguises herself as a prostitute. Uh, Judah passes by and, uh, and God sends the angel of lust to turn him aside without knowing that this is Tamar, his daughter-in-law. Uh, he has sex with her, she gets pregnant. And when he hears that she's pregnant, he's outraged incensed and there's the scene she comes he, she's brought before him and he says you know uh, who was the uh, father of you know who got you pregnant this is an outrage and she has his staff and his ring and she says this is the person who got me pregnant at that point uh he says you're more righteous than i i apologize you're right he marries her uh this is blessed by God because she gives birth to twins. And that's always a sign of blessing. Um, uh, one of the twins is named Zerach, which is my brother's Hebrew name. And the other is Peretz. And Peretz gives, is the grandfather um, uh, of Boaz. Uh, so, uh, so Boaz will, ma will marry through Leverite obligation Ruth and, uh, and, and, and they will uh, and uh, uh, be the progenitors of uh, the monarchy, the Davidic monarchy, and uh, and through them, uh, the Messiah will come from that lineage. That's the that's the theological, um, that's the theology. Um, so, um, so the tractate Yavamis is all about this topic, and, and it, it's quite uh, appropriate to be studying it right now. It's very interesting. Uh, so, the Book of Ruth purports to be a story that takes place in the time of the Judges, which was the period after Joshua conquered the land and, uh, and before Saul uh, was made king, around 1000 BCE. The Septuagint actually accepts this characterization and places the Book of Ruth between Judges and Samuel. The Masoretic system places Ruth in the Ketuvim, which includes the book of Esther and the Song of Songs. In other words, the Masoretic system puts Ruth with the other books that were written in the late biblical period. Uh, most modern scholars believe that the book was written uh, after the fall of Babylon uh, to the Persians when Ezra and Nehemiah mounted their campaign to rebuild the temple and restore animal sacrifices. They famously demanded that Israelite men divorce their non-Israelite women. And the book of Ruth was written in opposition to this hardline perspective. According to Robert Alter, a leading biblical scholar who has translated the entire Hebrew Testament, the book is part of a quote, veritable explosion of new narrative genres that characterizes the late biblical period. For all the polemic thrusts of this text, it is quite unlike any of the narratives written during the first temple period. Uh, the setting is bucolic, Bethlehem is a small town, scarcely a city, and the action of the two central characters takes place outside of the town, in the fields and on the threshing floor. Uh, harvesting and agriculture are palpable presence in the story, unlike the narratives uh, from Genesis to Kings, uh, where even pastoral settings are riven with tensions and often punctuated by violence, the world of Ruth is a placid bucolic world where the landowner and workers greet each other decorously and, uh, and blessings are uh, in the name of the Lord, where the traditional practices such as Levite marriage and, and leaving unpicked ears of corn for the poor are punctiliously observed. According to Alter, this story is a, quite, is a quiet polemic against the opposition of Ezra and Nehemiah to the intermarriage uh, with the surrounding peoples when the uh, Judahites returned to the land in the fifth century BC. Who were the Moabites? Uh, readers uh, should note that for biblical Israel, Moab is an extreme negative case of a foreign people, uh, a perennial enemy of Israel. Its origins, according to the story of Lot's daughter in Genesis 19, are in an act of incest. As the story goes, Judah, one of the sons of Jacob, has three sons, Er, Onan, and Shela. Er marries Tamar and dies. Onan, now faced with the Leverite obligation to impregnate his brother's wife, spills his seed on the ground. This is enough to earn him heavenly death sentence. 
Judah, afraid to give Tamar his surviving son, uh, leaves Tamar in limbo and uh, she takes matters into her own hands, as I explained before. So, um, uh, and she gives birth to Perez and Sarah, and Perez is the grandfather of Boaz. The Torah actually bans any sort of intercourse, social, cultic, or sexual, with the Moabites. And it's against this background of hostility, uh, Moab in this book provides refuge for the family of Elimelech, uh, fleeing famine, uh, just as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, uh, and the and two Moabite daughters are, are faithful, loving women with Ruth, uh, Ruth's moral nobility uh, altogether exemplary. It is this that Boaz is aware of from the outset, and he is not put off by her Moabite or identity. Uh, unlike the kinsman who declines to perform the Levite obligation, Ruth is a perfectly virtuous, Eshet Chayil, worthy woman, and she becomes the progenitor of the royal line uh, of, of Judah. It is hard not to see in the bodily iconoclastic invention of this plot, an argument against the exclusionary policy of foreign wives promulgated by Ezra Nehemia. This would also make the fifth century BC the most, uh, the moment when intermarriage was an urgent issue, a plausible time for the composition of the book. As with uh, the Exodus, we are dealing with a story whose reality is not so much in its actually being a true story as much as it being accepted as sacred history. The story is a reality, even if the events are all fictional. And like the Exodus, this story has been accepted as sacred history. So there you have it. Uh, instead of a virgin birth in Judaism, the Messiah comes from incest between Lot uh, and his eldest daughter and prostitution between Tamar and Judah. Uh, it is helpful to understand that religions are social constructions and that the truths they propound evolve over time. Well, there you have it. Uh, I, uh, I, I hope uh, you enjoy it. Uh, leave any comments you have in the, in the, in the uh, little comment section. Uh, I'll be getting back on Sundays and, and continuing the tradition in, in with evolving uh, religion and and my uh, and my more bad news videos. So uh, thank you. Uh, I hope you enjoy it.